In this problem, uh, it's another example of where you probably want to work backward uh, so that you don't get stuck. What kind of uh, strategies did you use to do this? To work backwards? To do the problem. What, what kind of things did you think about? To add a carbon, you could use a green reagent. Okay, you're just adding one carbon, so probably a good thing to do there is to use a Grignard reagent. All right. Um, let's think about that then. What else do you see about, what else is interesting about where that carbon is added? What? Uh, probably, to, well, it doesn't necessarily need a rearrangement, but you need to move the functional group over through a couple steps. Is that what you mean? Because it has to go from where the bromine is to over the other side. But the, is it significant that you're adding the carb, you're adding uh, a carbon or a methyl group to a carbon that has an alcohol on it? What does that tell you? Yeah, that you can add to an aldehyde actually in this case. But yeah, adding to a carbonyl will leave that alcohol there. So whenever you see carbons connecting where there's also an alcohol, it's a good bet that you're going to be doing a uh, Grignard addition to a carbonyl. Can you do that addition that I don't know, you sort of trailed off at the end there. <laughs> let's let's take it step by step. So if if we're doing if we're going to add that uh, carbon, that methyl group via Grignard chemistry, that means that We're doing something like this, right? All right. So well, now we need to take some steps back to figure out how to connect back to the starting material. So where do you make aldehydes from? Um, you, well, you can, I mean, it can just be like a one, uh, it can be like a one step process in Tadas. Uh, okay. Which would just be H HgOAc2. Like it would be anti Markovnikov of adding uh, uh, alcohol. Is it all is it Hold on, you're a step ahead of me. But where do we get the the aldehyde from? You gotta get it from. Uh, you gotta get it from OH. Right. So there there are a few ways. If we go back to kind of in general, can you can either oxidize an alcohol. Right, which we talked about on Monday, or you can uh, hydrate an alkyne. That was old first semester stuff. Or you can cleave an alkene. That was analysis, also first semester stuff. Um, and those might be various of those might be more likely than others. In this case, because nothing else weird is happening with the carbon skeleton. Um, it, probably the easiest, the first choice, as I mentioned on Monday, is to assume that this came from the oxidation of an alcohol. What type of conditions uh, would you use for that oxidation then? Right, you'd need a slightly less harsh oxidation conditions because we don't want to get the carboxylic acid, we want the alcohol. All right. So then moving on. Now we have more of kind of a standard functional group switch or rearrangement type problem like we did back in chapter 12, where we had a bromine on one carbon and then we want an alcohol on a different carbon. Um, so what kind of strategies did we use for that? Yeah. Uh, you want to get a, um, I forget, it's like BH3 and THF, and then the methyl addition across the double bond. Right. Since we want the alcohol on the less substituted uh, carbon, we're looking at hydroboration and oxidation of an alkene. All right. And then we know we can get that alkene through elimination. Do we have to be careful of? Uh, base we use, we pick here for the elimination? Yeah. In this case, we don't. 
In this case, you could use something as simple as sodium hydroxide and get good elimination. Why is that? Right. There's only one possible elimination spot, and that double bond is then going to be in resonance with the rest of the ring, so it's pretty favorable. So you actually need pretty mild conditions. In fact, you could but probably eliminate that like in water. If you heated it up a little bit, maybe water and a little bit of base. You, you could use like NaO methyl. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much anything that's even somewhat basic would would do that. All right, so um, this is an example of something that we, you know, keep doing, and then it uses this step from Monday. Incidentally, if we didn't have that, you could still do this, but you'd have to go from here and then brominate and then eliminate to make an alkyne and then do the hydration to get the aldehyde. So kind of a less, probably less direct, um, less useful route. But you could have done that. So a lot of when we were learning, when we were learning more and more reactions, even though it gets difficult because you have a lot more reactions to keep track of, it also makes these types of problems a little bit easier because you have a lot of choices of what to use. All right. Questions about that? Okay, let's continue on with ethers and epoxy. So the chemistry of ethers um, like this is not all that interesting. As we talked about, they make good solvents. Um, primarily because they don't do a whole lot. They don't do a lot of reactions. We're going to talk about pretty much just one reaction of, e of these types of ethers. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about epoxides, which are a lot more interesting. Um, one thing that ethers are important for is complexing metals. You'll learn more about this if you go on and take inorganic chemistry. But the oxygen atoms and the lone pairs in the oxygen atoms in ethers can actually attach to metals and do some interesting things. Um, so you'll, I don't know, we haven't been that strict about it in this class, but whenever you see a literature uh, example of formation of a Grignard, it's always done in some kind of ether, either diethyl ether or THF. So that's diethyl ether. And then we write this like that. And I told you that even though we write it like that, we think about it as a negatively charged methyl, there's actually a lot more going on here. Um, and the th part of what's going on here is that the ether is actually important in the reaction. So you have, um, you have kind of a situation where it's like this, and then the ether is bound to the magnesium. And this is even a simplification because there are a whole, there's a, like a whole network of this stuff in solution, all kind of bonding together with each other, sharing electrons back and forth. But the solvent is an integral part of that. And so for some Grignards, you have to use one type of ether or another type of ether. It's not simply the thing that everything is dissolved in. It's actually a participant in the reaction. Um, another important part of ether metal complexation behavior is something called crown ethers. which are large molecules with multiple oxygens that can sort of hold a metal ion in them. Um, perhaps, the, well, the smallest, easiest to draw one, we'll start with that. Looks like this. So they're large pieces? Yeah. So this is one of them. Uh, this is known as 12 crown 4. It's, it's a polyether, so it has multiple ethers in it. Um, and the 12 comes from the number of atoms, and then the 4 is the number of oxygen. So this is 12 crown 4. You can have uh, 15 crown 5, 18 crown 6. <coughs> they get bigger and bigger and have more oxygens. The reason that these are important is that they can actually hold a metal ion inside them
And this has some very important um, consequences for solubility chemistry. The book gives a good example. If you take something like, say you want to use fluoride. We talked about using fluoride to get rid of uh, protecting groups, for instance. Something like potassium fluoride is not soluble in most organic solvents, nonpolar solvents like benzene and stuff. Because it's ionic, it's strongly ionic, and it doesn't dissolve in organic solvents. It dissolves in things like water. Well, what if you want to do organic reactions with it? What you can do is use a crown ether to sequester the potassium ion and allow you to actually do whatever reaction you want to do. So this one's a little bit tricky to draw, but the best way to do this is to actually draw the shape of oxygens first and then connect two carbons in between each one. So we're going to use uh, 18 crown 6. So we're going to draw six oxygens evenly spaced out like that. And then we connect them with two carbons each. So that's 18 crown 6. And the potassium ion will sit in here. leaving the fluoride ion free. And the crown ether will actually dissolve in, uh, well, the sequestered ion inside the crown ether will dissolve in organic solvents. And so you can actually do this um, in, in a solvent like benzene. So this is a nice way to uh, dissolve the ionic compounds in uh, nonpolar media it's using crown ethers. It's similar to the chemistry known as chelation chemistry, which is what um, there's things like chelation therapy, which helps remove heavy metals from the body by using not crown ethers usually, but similar molecules um, that also have a lot of oxygens and nitrogens that can complex these metals. So um, there's some other examples in the book uh, of those mostly just recognize that they're ethers and that this is what they do. You choose what size crown ether you want based on the ion that you want to put inside. So a larger crown ether, like 18 crown 6, can take a large ion like potassium. A small crown ether, like 12 crown 4, might take something like lithium instead, which is smaller. Um, it's actually relatively recent. Um, it's known as host guest chemistry. It was a Nobel Prize in 1987. And, and yeah, it came from, we knew for a long time that atoms like oxygen will attach to metals. So these chemists, um, actually I think I have their names here, uh, Cram and Lane, um, discovered these compounds by sort of planning them out. Like, well, what if we could get a molecule that had a bunch of these things in it? Would it actually, you know, it had the, the hypothesis was, would it actually trap the metal? And so they made it. It did. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about some synthesis. So how do you make ethers? Um, the book mentions an industrial method, uh, impractical for small chemicals, really. But that's what, how they would make diethyl ether. We won't go through that now. The most important is a two-step process that you probably have seen before, but you didn't know it, called the Williamson ether synthesis. It's fairly straightforward. It's just some SN2 chemistry. So you take an alcohol. And you deprotonate it 
with a base. Usually sodium hydride is used traditionally here. And then you react it with a halide. And you end up with the ether. So let's look at that mechanism. What happens first here? You have this in the presence of hydride. Pulls the H off, right. What is significant about that base? Why is that base used here? Uh, it's strong, yeah. It forms hydrogen gas. So that makes it, first of all, push the equilibrium strongly in the uh, to the right, forward in the forward direction. Any strong base will deprotonate it, but there's always equilibrium associated with acids and bases, right? There's a back and forth there. If you make hydrogen gas and it actually leaves your reaction, you no longer have to worry about it as part of the <coughs> equilibrium anymore. So forming hydrogen gas is a good way to fully deprotonate a compound. Uh, and so that's why it's done this way. And then you have some kind of a halide, and the oxygen undergoes SN2 type substitution to make the ether. So, is that the same most times when you see uh, hydrogen gas bubbling up? It's a deprotonation? Um, yeah, I mean, not always. It depends what reaction is. I mean, there's lots of reactions that produce gas. Not, it's, you know, it's not always hydrogen. Sure. Carbon dioxide is another commonly produced gas to make equilibria, but yeah. In an, in an acid-base reaction, it's unlikely because you'd know if you were using a hydride. So, you know, if you think about things like carbonic acid or sodium bicarbonate, that's carbon dioxide because that molecule breaks down to form for car uh, carbon dioxide. So this is how you make ethers. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. There's just one um, trick here. I'm not going to say it's a trick, but something that you have to watch out for is you, if you're trying to make the ether, you have to make a um, smart decision about which side is going to be coming from the alcohol and which side is going to be coming from the halide. So let's do an example. This is methyl terbutyl ether, or MTBE. It's a common, um, common solvent. Let's say you want to make this using an ether synthesis. There are two ways that you could think about doing that. You could think we'll, we'll go a, a red way and a blue way. Sorry if you're colorblind. This is the red way. And this is the blue way. So for you, it can be the left way and the right way. You could think about breaking either of those. If you go the red way, then what you're saying is that this is coming from methanol, which you're then deprotonating and reacting with tert-butyl halide. To the iodide. If you go the blue way, that says that you're starting with terbutanol, and reacting with the methyl halide. One of these works, and one of them does not. 
which one works and why? Or which one doesn't work and why? The red one doesn't work. The red one doesn't work. Why? Yes. Um, what? That's what I would guess. Why? Right. So if you think about this <coughs> mechanistically, which is how you come to this conclusion, you realize that what's going to happen in this red route is you're going to make methoxide ion after it gets deprotonated. Okay. And then you're asking that to react with tert-butyl iodide. But that's unlikely to substitute because this is a hindered tertiary substrate. So what's likely to happen here? Um, in this reaction. You're going to get an alkene. You're going to get elimination. So that's going to be your product. Plus methanol. The, this methoxide is a strong base. It's actually probably a better base than it is a nucleophile. So if it has an opportunity to do elimination, it will. Why isn't that an issue with the blue route? I mean, terbutoxide is an even stronger elimination base. Why don't we see elimination there? Well, yeah, that's true, but more, there's actually a more important reason. There's not a second carbon. So if we go this route, yes, you form a very strong, good elimination base in tert-butoxide, but it's going to be reacting with methyl iodide, which you can't do elimination on because there's only one carbon. So in that case, your only choice is to do the substitution, and you should get good yield there. So the more efficient route generally is to substitute to the less hindered or less substituted um, side and use the more hindered one as the alcohol that you start with. So we'll say choose carefully. Make sure that you're you're actually forming what you want to form. Okay. There's one more type of ether synthesis that we should talk about, which again is something that you've probably seen before. Alkoxymercuration. This is the same as oxymercuration, the, ad the addition of water that you would have seen last uh, semester. And depending on w what you did last semester, you may have seen this also. You can do this with other alcohols as well. And you form an ether. So you can take, let's say, <coughs> this alkene. Now in oxymercuration, your first step would be to react with mercury acetate and water, right? But instead of water, you can actually use an alcohol. So let's say ethanol. And then you still want to get rid of the mercury. And the product there is instead of an OH on the more substituted carbon, you get an OR, depending on what alcohol you added on the more substituted carbon. So the same thing. We won't go through the mechanism again. You can look that up from last semester. You're just using a different alcohol to substitute on the um, mercury and ion, and that gets you ultimately an ether. And so you should notice this, that this is possible, that this is how it works. In a synthetic situation, 
you wouldn't have to do this because you could do the same thing by adding water, getting the alcohol, right, and then doing the previous reaction to get to make your ether. So you wouldn't ever necessarily have to do this uh, from a paper chemistry standpoint. But if you're given these conditions, you should know what they do, that they do indeed form an alcohol or an ether. Yeah. So in that case, you want to go via the alcohol, if that's the ether that you want. OK. So let's move on and talk about reactions of ethers. Actually, we should probably just call it reaction of ethers. Um, We'll, we'll stick with reactions. There are other reactions of ethers, but we'll mostly just focus on one. Remember, we said they're, they're unreactive to a variety of conditions. Even very strong things like Grignard reagents won't react with ethers. Um, but acids actually can. They can be cleaved acidically. It's not really a word. They can be cleaved in acid. We'll stick with that. Like this. So not only do you need an acid, but you need an acid that has a reasonably good nucleophile as its conjugate base. So something, some HX type thing, like HI or HBr is usually used. And what will happen is you protonate the uh, oxygen in the middle and then do a substitution. So your products are the alcohol and the halide. So now as, I'm not going to say a challenge, but it's something you should probably be able to do. Why don't you write the mechanism? So you propose the mechanism for that reaction. All right, let's talk about this. When you're, when you're trying to figure out a mechanism, it's sort of the opposite procedure of when we talk about doing these synthesis problems. You want to work very forwards step by step, trying to figure out what is the most likely thing that would happen in each case as you get new reagents uh, or new steps. So you start with your ether in HBr. What is likely to be the first thing that happens here? So if I didn't say this was a mechanism or this was some thing, I just said, here are two molecules. What is probably going to happen? What would you say? Protonation, Protonation right? You have a strong acid. And in fact, and you can write this down, any time you're doing a reaction in strong acid, I, don't, I hesitate to make too many absolutes, but the vast majority of the time you're doing any reaction in acid, the first step is some kind of a protonation. Something gets protonated. Because if you, if you put something in acidic solution, that's just what will likely happen. So, um, assuming that the acid is more acidic than the other thing, which is why you put it in there in the first place. So your first step will be uh, protonation of the ether. To give this kind of ion. So what happens next? Is the Br now going to act as? Uh, I, but you have a positive charge, so I mean, would the Br likely go to the O in that case, or would it would it attack one of the CHs? Well, uh, good question. So if the bromine goes to the oxygen, it, it's kind of an equilibrium situation. Oh, this is an equilibrium. Right now. These steps are always going to be in equilibrium. So, so I mean, all chemistry is to some degree. So yeah, if the bromine attacks the oxygen and loses a CH3 minus, then you have a very strong base in the negatively charged CH3 minus, and you still have the positive charge in the oxygen. So you haven't really helped yourself energetically in that situation. So would the, then, the, would the, C, the, would the CH3 just come off? One of them? Well, the bromine would attack there, and you'd actually do SN2 reaction. And that then alleviates those both formal charges. Okay. 
The other thing that when you're trying to develop a mechanism that you don't necessarily know, but you're trying to just draw one that makes sense, <coughs> keep in mind that you generally know the products. You can use that to your advantage. You can say, okay, I know that's where I have to end up eventually. So whatever steps I take, they should be likely given the mixture of stuff of chemicals, but they should ultimately end in that as quickly as possible. Um, and so that's what you would get here. Okay. Now to the question, James, it was your question, right? Yeah. About asymmetric ethers. You have a similar issue to before. So let's say you have um, we'll do a couple different examples. Let's try this one. Actually, they list this one as being done with HI, but that's fine. And these are usually in excess just because you need to kind of push that equilibrium forward and heat them up. So we'll try that one. And then also uh, take a look at this one. Hmm? Draw the product, but ultimately we're trying to find the product, but you may want to go via the mechanism so that you can see what's more likely to happen. Okay, so try both of these. See if you can find the product and the mechanism. And I, I would recommend going through and doing the mechanism as a way to the product. On this first one, again, you go through it mechanistically and you try to figure out where would this go. So the first step is to protonate that alcohol, or that ether, sorry. Right. And then the question is, well, what's going to happen next? Um, Which side is the iodide going to attack on? And most people found or thought that the iodide would attack over here like that. Now, why is that the case? Why doesn't it attack right here? Because it's more like negative than the other bond. Mm -hmm. like the so That's true, but there's even a more important reason. That's also true, but it actually doesn't apply here. This isn't a tertiary carbon. This is an sp2 hybridized carbon. It's a different thing. Then it's, then it's more negative Well, more importantly, yes, but more importantly, sp2 carbons can never undergo substitution in this way, can never undergo nucleophilic substitution in this way, because the orbitals aren't lined up right. Remember, if you think back to last semester, Remember, when in the mechanism of substitution, the nucleophile has to come in from exactly the opposite side of the leaving group and go into that antibonding orbital so that it allows the, the leaving group to come off. Well, in an sp3 hybridized um, molecule, that directly behind is kind of in between the other three things, right? But in an sp2 hybridized one, the right behind is right in between two bonds. And so there's not enough room for a nucleophile to actually get in there and access that orbital. And in a benzene ring, there's even less room. If you think about it geometrically, the iodide would have to actually come into the center of the benzene ring to be in the right spot to do that substitution. And it would require the benzene ring to then invert its configuration. Neither of those things is going to happen. So that's why the iodide, it's not possible to come in over there. You can only have substitution on sp3 hybridized carbons this type of substitution. So you follow that out and you find that the only possible product here is this one. All right, let's look at the next one. Same thing, you show the protonation. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. So a lot of people, pretty much everybody who, who tried this, who got this far, said that likely the bromine will attack here. And you end up with this and this. But there's a confounding factor here. What is the mm -hmm. confounding factor? Why is that not quite right? Uh, because of the carbocation will be more stable on the outer side. That's right. A self-reaction, a reaction that is only first order, that only um, d uh, depends on one molecule, will generally be faster than a second order reaction that requires two molecules to come together. So before the bromine attacks this carbon, it is likely that this will simply leave because it can form a tertiary carbocation first. So it's more likely, we'll keep that one in blue, it's more likely, I think, probably a little bit faster, that this will actually form first and then the bromine attacks the carbocation. So in all likelihood, this wouldn't be a very clean reaction. It would probably be a little messy, meaning you'd get some of both. So you'd get a mixture of four different products. Um, but I think, I think that, you'd have, that the, the major product would be this one. So watch for that possibility of doing SN1 substitution rather than SN2 if the substrate calls for it. So this is the SN2, and this is the SN1. Right, but this goes, this undergoes, or this process goes via SN, via substitution chemistry, but could be either one depending on the substrate. Um, can you explain again why they would favor SN1? Um, in, so the first step of an SN1 process is simply the leaving of the leaving group, right? In an SN2 process, it's the substrate and the nucleophile coming together. That's, that's the step, the rate determining step. So the reason that this might be a little bit faster is because statistically, it's more likely that a molecule will be faster to simply fall apart on its own than the two molecules in solution will happen to bump into each other in just the right way. So it's sort of a, um, it's kind of, it's a, it's a sort of statistical argument that bas basically what I'm saying is that if you have, if this molecule forms, that ethanol will fall off as a leaving group before a bromine bumps into it just right to actually do the reaction. Um, now whether that's true or not, you have to do the experiment and find out. But um, when you have a carbocation that can be pretty stable, like a nice tertiary one like that, that is a fairly quick process. All right, any other questions about that? Yeah. How minor is the I don't know. I don't know. We have to do the experiment and see. It's going to change for every substrate. I don't know. OK, we have a few more minutes. Um, but I'd rather get up and get going to the lab today. So Monday, we will get into epoxides, um, which is all kinds of interesting chemistry. That's a good stopping place anyway.